in the first part of the lecture, we, we talked a little bit about the, the history, the history of cotton, but, you know, cotton cloth was used by the people of ancient Egypt and China and India, um, you know, Mexico, Peru and the Americas, um, you know, cotton was grown again in the southern U.S. colonies as soon as they were established. And, um, you know, in 1793, the uh, American Eli Whitney created a way to mechanize um, to mechanize the removing of you know, the cotton plant from the, the fiber from from the plant itself. And, you know, the cotton gin changed the process uh, where, as, um, you know, 50 pounds of cotton a day could be processed through a cotton gin when only a handful of a handful of pounds of cotton had been um, produced before. So, you know, by 1859, the U.S. Um, was producing 4.5 million bales of cotton, and again, it was the leading the leading export. Um, by 1950, though, um, cotton was still king, and 80% of cotton mills were in the South. And um, you know, by the 80s, by the late 80s, early 90s, just because the, of what was happening in our world, the pr production of of cotton just really moved moved offshore. Um, so we still grow it, but we don't we don't produce it uh, any anymore. Um, and unfortunately, what has happened in the production of cotton is that um, you know developing countries really, since they could save on labor and production costs, they had what was what's known as the race to the bottom, where companies and, and countries just competed with each other by cutting wages living standards for workers and, you know, those production, the, that production just moved to places where the lowest wages and production costs existed, which, you know, is, is, it's just a different form of, of enslavement. I mean, really, it's just, yes, yes, the people in emerging economies are getting paid, but are they getting paid a, a living, a living wage? But, I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna get off my soapbox and, and move on, right? So, so the production, the production of cotton. So um, cotton grows any place where growing season is long. So it needs 160 to 180 days to mature and it needs a hot climate with adequate rainfall and irrigation. So that's why the Southern United States is perfect for it. And when you looked at some of the other countries that produces cotton, they're warmer countries, right? So, so uh, the leaders right now are India, Pakistan, and China. And if you don't know, China has some desert. So China does have some warm, really warm areas, but also countries in South America, um, in the Indian Peninsula and African nations, because they have what's needed. They have that 180 days um, and either adequate rainfall or irrigation. Um, oddly, the cotton plant will not, um, will not form. So this, this cotton boil that you see, this puff that you see will not form if the temperature is below 70, 70 degrees. So they need that 160 to 180 days of less than 70 degrees. Um, so in the United States, cotton will grow in 17 states. And, um, you know, it, in the southern part of the United States, it actually will grow from Southern Virginia to actually to Central California. So if you kind of just cut all the way across the middle of our country, uh, cotton will grow. Historically, it has been the South where it, where it, ha where it has grown. Um, and again, the major producers um, continue to be to continue to be, um, you know, China um, produces about 26 percent. India does about 25. The U.S. does about 11. Pakistan, 8. And Brazil, 5. And if we think about geographically where these countries are, they're literally all over the world. So um, you know, in addition, you know, Turkey and, and Mexico, you know, they also significantly uh, contribute to the production, the production of cotton. And um, in 2017, um, over 480 um, million pounds of cotton was produced. Um, and it is just something that the world needs. Like I said, it just, it drives the economy all over the world, okay? So cotton, as you see it here, grows on bushes from three feet to six feet high. 
and it blossoms into what we see here, which is uh, which looks like a cotton ball. It's an, it's called a boil um, or a seed pod. Um, and inside the boil, in addition to this fiber that we see, there are seven to eight seeds with several hundred thousand cotton fibers. So rem let's go remember we, why cotton is so cute. We, we saw that, right? So each seed is essentially just a fiber, so much like the silkworm. Um, it's just it's just a fiber. And, you know, each cotton seed has about 20,000 fibers growing on them, right, from each surface. And when the boil is ripe, about the size of the walnut, that, that fiber is exposed. And part of the production of cotton is, is, is pulling the boil from the plant itself and then extracting, extracting the seed. So, um, so that is really important for, for you to know. So how do we get it off, <laughs> right? How do we get it off? Fortunately now, cotton is, is most often, is, is more often than not picked, picked by machines in uh, industrialized economies. Um, even in some of the emerging economies, it is harvested at least by machines. Um, and then the separation and the, the grading process is done by hand. But, um, you know, cotton um, oftentimes when they're harvesting, they're harvesting both mature and immature, uh, immature um, um, plants. And, you know, after it's picked, so after the machine picks it, it's um, compressed into a brick that weighs about 22,000 pounds and then taken to the gin, um, in my air quotes, the gin, which is just the mill, the mill that separates the fibers from the seed, uh, from the seed, and and that's that's really important. Um, you know, uh, in the gin, it picks out the 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 um, fibers and in almost like a knife-like comb. So think of like a fine tooth comb. That's what the boils are run through, which separates the seam, uh, separates the seeds. Um, and permits the fiber to be carried through. So it's it's combed. I mean, literally like you would comb your hair, the, the cotton fibers are combed. And these fibers are actually called, of all things, lint, <laughs> right? We know that word. We know it in a different context, but it's actually called lint. And the lint are then pressed into square blocks, which are known as bales, and the bales weigh about 480 pounds each, actually, they weigh exactly 480 pounds each, right? Because that's the that's the unit measurement, um, and then they're sold to be either um, milled or or exported. So one of the one of the things in the production of cotton is that um, they're really um, cotton because it's a plant. Because it is a plant, it's susceptible to not only the elements, but it's, it's susceptible to diseases. Um, and, and insects, um, it's susceptible to fungus, it's susceptible to drought. And in, in, the, in the 1920s, there actually, um, there actually is a insect called the boll, B-O-L-L, -L, weevil, which you know, you may have heard that word, the bug, a boll weevil, but a boll weevil is actually a, an insect that eats the cotton, the bowl of cotton <laughs> um, fibers, right? So there are efforts to fo uh, that are focusing on breeding other forms of cotton that um, breeding varieties of cotton. So genetically enhancing or modifying cotton that are more resistant to these diseases and, and therefore do not have to have the insecticide, pesticide applied to them, which again has an environmental impact. All right, so the physical structure of cotton. This is, um, I don't want to say this slide is going to be lengthy, but it is going to be lengthy because there's a lot, there's a lot to talk about. The physical uh, structure of cotton. And, you know, even though there are some naturally colored, and I put that in air quotes, colored cotton, um, and when I say natural, you know, light browns, um, beiges, uh, most cotton produced and consumed is actually a creamy, creamy white color. And as we saw in our video, how cute cotton is, that cotton fiber is a single cell that grows from the seed um, and grows 
over a thousand times as long as it is thick. So it's it is a very thin fiber, but it's a very it's a very long fiber. But unlike the silk thread, the processing process, so the way it's processed, it, it's processed, you, you cannot pull a full cotton strand out because it because of the way it wraps around each other. So you can never get a full a full cotton um, fiber out like you could like you can with silk. Um, the other really thing that is important to note is the length. And so we've been talking about about length and we, we talked a lot about it, a lot, a lot about it when we talked about silk. But, you know, staple length is important because, as we know, it determines how the fiber, um, what the fiber will do in, in the spinning process. So um, so the length of cotton fibers um, usually range from a half to two inches just depending on their genetic variety. So um, in terms of some of the other staple fibers that we've that we've looked at, it's it's not as long. But longer cotton fibers are thinner and make stronger yarns. And um, you know, oddly enough, the length is determined by removing a sample from a bale uh, and sorting the fibers by length and calculating the average staple length of that bale. So we, we talked about the bale is 480 pounds. They go in, they take a little sample, um, and then they pull out those fibers and determine the length and then make a determination of what that overall bale, the quality of that, that bale is, is going to be. So, um, you know, fiber length um, determines the fineness, it determines the strength, and the length is also an important consideration for, for in, for in use, okay. Um, there are a couple of long staple fibers that are considered to be of higher quality and are used to produce softer, smoother, and more luxurious fabrics. And you know these words, right? You know these um, because their their value um, is perceived as higher. They're they're labeled uh, in a particular way. So you have heard Pima cotton. Supima cotton, Egyptian cotton, or Sea Island. And, you know, generally, in as a consumer, you hear Pima cotton um, in terms of a knitted cotton, and you hear Egyptian um, or Sea Island in terms of a woven. So a Pima cotton would be like a sweater, you know, maybe a blanket, an Egyptian cotton, maybe a, a shirt, you know, a woven shirt, or sheets right so we, we hear of, of Egyptian cotton sheets like they're the finest you know sheet that you can you can get right um, and that's just because they they have um, much long long staple staple um, fibers moving on to the physical the physical structure of cotton you know the image that you see here is is cotton under a microscope so we see a fiber on the right and then on the left we see a cross section of the fiber and if we if you look at the fiber under um, a microscope so if you look at the cross-sectional view or the the longitudinal view um, we see that cotton has ribbon-like twist, right? And that um, that makes it, it it stronger. We've talked about crimp, right? It, it's the same thing. It's a, um, it's not coily, it's wavy, it's wavy. So, um, you know, this, this twist, this crimp um, helps in the, the it, it helps cotton have such versatility that you can weave it in many different ways right because it's not um it's not as coily as as a, a wool fiber would be so you can you can make a knit out of it you can make a woven out of it you can make a stretch it out of it you can make a adorable woven woven out of it so it does have a lot more um in uses because it has some texture to the fiber but not so much texture that it limits what what you can do what you can do for, uh, with it. Okay. Um, in terms of fineness, cotton fibers um, vary from you know 16 to 20 microns uh, in diameter. And again, we we the cross section that we see here, and if you see this cross section, there's many different versions of the cross section. That cross section 
is determined by the maturity of the fiber. So we talked about earlier um, it, with the production of cotton that oftentimes immature cotton plants are pulled up and cultivated, I mean, and pulled up um, in the, in the um, process of cultivating, of, of um, exposing, of, why can't I get this out, in the process of collecting the cotton fibers, right? So we, we the, the most mature ones that you see here, if you go back and look at this, if you look at this image um, on, in the cross section, look at the, if you look at the cross section, anything that is shaped like, just like a U, if it looks, if it's a U, that is the most mature plant. And if you look at it, you see there are several U's here, and then there's some kind of L's and a couple of S's, right? But the U shape shows us, um, what's mature and what's immature. Um, and we also see that some have a very, very thick walls and some have very thin walls and then almost a canal, a canal in them. So all of those things determine, determine the fineness. And remember, when we talk about a bale of cotton, it's 480 pounds and it's a variety of all of these different structures, different structures together. Okay, um, cotton is like like I started with. Cotton does come in a range of, of, of colors, and you know naturally cre creamy white is the most highly desirable because it can be dyed and printed the easiest. Um, but you know sometimes um, you know the fibers may yellow with age. So if it's been harvested um, but not processed, it's just sitting in a bale someplace. It may become yellow. And if there's too much rain right before the harvest, it tends to become become gray. So, you know, cotton farmers manage their harvest around what's happening, <laughs> what's happening with the weather. So, if they know that rain is coming in the in the in the days uh, preceding harvest, they'll push the harvest up in order to uh, not have those gray fibers. But what happens is you get more immature fibers if you if you harvest a little bit a little bit earlier. So finishing up with the the physical structure of cotton, um, even though it's harvested mostly by machines, you know, grading for the most part, grading and classification of cotton is is still mostly done by hand. It you know it's done in very in small and much in much more small doses um, by machines and that's much more in industrialized um, first world uh, nations but in emerging economies the classification is still done by hand and um, you know the characteristics that the graders are looking for is they're looking for staple length and the color of cotton from the bale um, and they compare those to standards that are prepared by the u.s department of, of agriculture and prices and end uses of that bale of cotton is determined by the length and grade and length and grade of the, of the cotton. So, you know, cotton classification describes the quality of the cotton in terms of, again, the staple length and then the character, um, you know, fiber lengths for cotton include very short staple cotton. So less than a quarter of an inch, um, short staple, um, which goes to a little less than an inch, medium staple, which goes to a little more than an inch, long staple, extraordinary long staple, extra long staple. Um, but staple length, again, is the length represented of the bundle of fibers just from a bale. And there actually are 19 staple lengths for cotton, right? Which is crazy, right? So if you think of one bale of cotton that they're doing a test on, there's 19 different classifications that, that they can use. And that's part of the reason why it, it's still, it's still, um, still done, done by hand. In terms of grading the cotton, um, so there are 19 different staple lengths, but there are actually 39 grades of, of cotton. And the grade refers to the color of the fiber, you know, the absence of dirt and, you know, seed and, you know, tangled fibers, um, you know, low quality fibers, defects, um, really the best quality grade is just luxurious and silky and white and clean, right? So it's not just like silk, right? Same, same thing. But 19 grades is, um, is really amazing for, 
for one fiber to have that many different categories. And again, those categories all have different end uses. And again, that shows you why cotton is, is able to you be used in such different manners. So, you know, if we look at one of the lower grades, that's what you're going to get in your cotton ball, right? That's <laughs> what is in your cotton ball and your Q-tip, one of the lower grades of cotton. And then the finer and finer you go um, is, is going to be what the end use is. And, you know, the, the great thing is the, you know, the predominant grade of cotton produced in the United States is, is kind of a, a middling, a middling cotton. So um, that means that that cotton is, you know, middling cotton uh, in terms of grade is most often used in mass produced cotton goods and in synthetic uh, cotton and synthetic blends. So much of the, much of the cotton that's produced in the United States actually does make it to the apparel market either as a complete cotton garment itself or as a as a cotton blend. Um, the grading system too is also um, used primarily for the creamy white fibers that dominate the market but you know those other colors that exist uh, the light spotted the spotted the tinge the yellow or the gray um, those are they have actually have a different grading system right it sounds crazy so we're 39 for just the creamy white fibers and then when we get to the those naturally colored ones there there really is a a, a different a different um a different system and you know some of the characteristics um that graders are looking for is again they're looking for smoothness smoothness they're looking for the uniformity of fibers um, they're going to look for strength um, they're going to look for um, what microns they are. Um, they're going to look at the amount of processing that's going to be necessary to produce a good white fabric for a commercial use. And, you know, because of variations in growing conditions in geographic locations, yarn and fabric producers carefully, carefully select cottons. Um, and blend cotton so that, you know, cotton um, fabrics are as uniform from year to year as possible. So that production from year to year is as uniform as, as possible. So think about it. You know, if you buy a T-shirt from, um, from Old Navy in the summer of 2000, well, I'm not going to say the summer because we didn't do nothing in the summer, <laughs> in the summer of 2020, and you buy that same cotton t-shirt in the spring of 2021, it looks the same, right? Um, even though they're produced at much different points in time, and that's because the you know producers carefully select and blend those cottons so that you can't see that there's any difference in, in the fibers.